Hello everyone and welcome to another one of the Hutnell Sixth Form Centre lecture series. I'm Mrs Etches, I'm a part-time economics teacher here at HSFC and I'm also a part-time research student at the University of Wolverhampton. And today I'm going to talk to you about social mobility, widening participation and why it matters. Now this topic is of particular interest to me because it forms part of the contextual and background information to my research but I'm hoping also that you'll find that by the end of the talk, you'll realise why this topic is also something which I think is very, very important to you as young people, as sixth formers in Nottinghamshire. So what am I going to talk to you about today? Well, first of all, I'm going to start by defining what we mean by social mobility. Um, I'm going to um, tell you about what the UK's position on social mobility is compared to other developed nations, according to some recent research. I'm going to explore views about whether higher education assists social mobility. Um, I'm going to explore what widening participation policy meant and what it means presently. And we're also going to look in the context of the local economy um, whether or not current policy is or isn't likely to boost social mobility in our neighbourhood. So firstly, what do we mean by social mobility? Well, there's lots and lots of definitions, but for quite a lot of the um, research I'm going to share with you during today's talk is by Lee Elliott Major, who is a professor of social mobility at the University of Exeter and Steve Machin, who is a professor of economics at the London School of Economics. And in their research, they've defined social mobility as um, the phrase that's written here, which says social mobility tells us how likely we are to climb up or fall down the economic or social ladder of life. And they discussed how lots of research into this by economists focuses on making comparisons between young people and their parents and discovering whether or not young people earn more and attain higher levels of education than their parents did. Um, and, you know, if, if that was the case, then we could argue that social mobility has happened. But if it wasn't the case, um, then we, we're questioning, you know, what has happened? Why haven't children done at least better than their parents? Um, now, in a moment, I'm going to share a fact with you that you may be aware of, but I'm going to also share some information with you, which you might find a little bit surprising. So here's some information you may know. Um, in a measure taking place in 2019-20, um, the United Kingdom was the sixth biggest economy in the world. So we're only a small country, but we, we punch quite well above our weight in terms of um, our economic performance. However, you might find this surprising. Um, Steve Machin looked at some data produced by a Canadian economist a few years ago and that those figures were updated by Blandon. And he, he pointed out how, how that research demonstrated that the UK had almost the worst level of social mobility out of a study of 11 developed nations only the United States had worse levels of social mobility than, than us in the United Kingdom. And um, Major and Machin concluded that Britain's um, levels of low social mobility arise in particular from something that they called stickiness um, between the richest and the poorest members of society. So sort of barriers that might get in the way of someone from um, lower income backgrounds um, climbing in, you know, up the kind of social ladder. And um, Major and Machin use this metaphor of a, a ladder quite a lot to discuss social mobility. And they, they described it as though if you were someone from a lower income background who was um, trying to achieve social mobility, it was almost as though as you climb the ladder and you try and progress, the rungs of the ladder get further and further apart. So it actually becomes harder and harder for you. Whereas um, they pointed out that if you were from a higher income or more privileged group, then climbing up the social ladder was relatively easy. It was as though the rungs of the ladder were closer together. 
and it was also a lot more difficult for you to fall backwards down the social ladder if you came from a more privileged group. Um, so Major and Maching concluded that Britain and the United States had um, lower levels of income mobility than other developed countries. But I said to you that my talk was, was also not just about social mobility, it was talking about widening participation in higher education. So how does widening participation connect to all this? And what does it mean for you as sixth form students today? Well, widening participation policy in higher education in the past has meant that um, it were, was policies enabled to um, increase participation amongst underrepresented groups. So, for example, in the past 20 years or so, there's been lots of initiatives to raise participation of students from low income backgrounds who might be first in family to apply for higher education, um, raise participation of disabled students, black and Asian minority ethnic group students and students who are studying courses, level three courses that weren't A-levels or indeed a mixture of courses with A-levels. So that might apply to a lot of you. You may well be studying um, two A-levels and a B-tech or one A-level, a Cambridge Technical and a B-tech um, and various other mixtures of level three courses. Um, so am I saying then um, that widening participation policies that have been in place you know for the last 20 or 25 years haven't worked um, well i'm going to share some some information with you in in a minute that um, major and machin pointed to as part of their research um, and what we can see is that overall um, participation rates in higher education now are much higher than they were in the 1980s and 1990s so we we may well see that as being a very good thing but, but what we can see is possibly policy has led to a sense of increasing participation and not necessarily widening participation to the extent that possibly policymakers had hoped for. And certainly, as we're going to see later on in this lecture, um, there is a shifting focus on widening participation nowadays in current government policy, um, which is a political decision and um, I'll share that with you a little bit later. But for now, let's just look at um, this, this bar chart that uh, Major and Machin in their research have drawn our attention to. Um, the three colours of bars on the bar chart represent three different income groups. So pale grey represents the highest income group, medium grey represents the middle income group, and the black bars represent the lowest income groups of society. So as I pointed out, um, we can definitely see if we look at 2013, which was the most recent data we had, um, participation rates at university and in higher education are much higher now than they were in the 80s and 90s. So that's a good thing. However, if we have a look at the 2013 figure on the bar chart for people from low income groups participating in higher education, and indeed, we compare that to the pale grey bar on the bar chart in 1981. What we can see is, in fact, despite widening participation policies for the last 20 or so years, we still are not yet seeing the same or greater levels of low income groups taking part in higher education than in fact the highest level income groups were in the 1980s. So although there has been an increase in numbers, these figures perhaps show us that there hasn't been the widening of participation to those lower income groups um, as we may have imagined there might have been. And in fact, we can see the biggest jump in participation in the last 20 or so years has been in the middle income groups and the highest income groups. So maybe more a case of increasing participation rather than widening participation. So what's the implications of widening participation policy? Why have governments in the past 20 years or so considered it to be important? Well, 
higher education is a pathway into well-paid jobs and also the most powerful professions and institutions in our society in Britain. It probably comes as no surprise to you if I tell you that those people from independent schools achieve the most access to the highest universities and um, the, the courses that open the doors to the best paid jobs and the most powerful um, positions in society to them. Um, but pupils at independent schools only make up around about 7% of total pupils. So I'm going to show you some information now um, that was produced by a charitable group who do a lot of work in the field of widening participation policy. Um, and they produce lots of data and they run lots of uh, schemes and courses to help young people. And the data that I'm going to show you in a moment was referred to by Major and Machin as part of their research. And what this Sutton Trust information showed us was um, what proportion of people in certain powerful professions in our society had actually been to independent schools. I'm not going to go through all of these examples because you can obviously see them for yourself. However, just let's look at a few. Of our current cabinet in government in 2019, 2020, 2021, 66% of Boris Johnson's cabinet have been to independent schools. And in fact, amongst the top civil service who uh, facilitate the operation of government in Westminster, 59% of those people have been to independent schools. 70% of high court judges have been to independent schools. So Major and Machin sort of pointed out that generally speaking, um, those people in our society who, who are in the positions of the most influence and power have been to um, the sort of most elite universities uh, nearly always Oxford and Cambridge and certainly Russell Group universities. Um, and possibly that is not necessarily representative of our society. So this is why social mobility matters. Um, I hope that we'd all agree that um, regardless of where we come from and what our background is, young people should have equal opportunities to achieve their full potential. And that was something that Major and Machin pointed out very clearly in their research. And in fact, as well, if we consider it from an economics point of view, something called human capital theory indicates that um, it makes sense for economies to make sure that young people actually achieve their full potential because it benefits economies. Um, but if people in the positions of most influence and power have been to independent schools and uh, Russell Group universities, um, they may not be representing us fully. And actually, if we could take steps to change this imbalance and we could gradually start to correct this imbalance, it could mean that those in the most powerful groups of society gradually in the future become more representative of us all. So thinking about ourselves here in Hutnell in Nottinghamshire, you know, why is what I'm saying relevant to you and why should you be concerned about what I'm talking about? Well, you may or may not be aware of this, but Hucknall as a town and the large portions of the NG15 postcode come into what is classified as a low participation neighbourhood in higher education. So that's abbreviated to LPN. And participation in higher education is measured by something called POLA, which is participation of local authority areas in higher education. And we fall into classifications POLA 1 and 2, which shows that we are of the lowest participation rates in higher education. If we were in the highest participation rate areas, we would be classed as polar levels four and five. But what exactly might that mean for us? Well, it means that as we stand here today, we have lower participation rates in higher education. That means for young people 
such as yourselves and those that are a few years behind you, there is less opportunity to access the higher paid employment and influential careers in the future if you're not participating in university and higher education. Um, it therefore means that that allows the kind of status quo position to uh, remain and that under representation of young people such as yourselves in the best paid jobs and the better careers among our society is allowed to continue. And some research by um, a lady called Patfield, she talks about the importance of trying to break what we call the first in family cycle. So the first in family cycle is where we're talking about, and it may be you, um, you would be the first generation amongst your family to go to university and higher education. And what Pat Fields research points out is that once someone goes to university in their family, clearly that starts to raise the participation levels of higher education within a neighbourhood. So that would start to make a change to the, um, the LPN and the polar rating for our neighbourhood. But furthermore, that step would help future generations because her research showed that if someone's parents have been to university, then there is an even greater likelihood of their children also going to university. So therefore, if you are the first generation today in 2021 to go to university, then not only does that make a change today for our local area, but it also will make a change for your children in the future, or at least there's a good chance it will. So does higher education, does participation in university definitely lead to social mobility? Well, this is a question that's debated by academics. And as you can imagine, as, as is often the case with academic debates, um, they don't always agree on, on these things. Um, so some people believe, yes, you know, higher education participation does help lead to social mobility for people from lower lower income groups. Um, so people like Major and Machin, Dilnot, because they would argue, well, participation in higher education increases someone's chances of getting into a higher paid job, um, probably a professional job, and therefore improving their levels of social mobility and also for that of their children going forward. But some people disagree. So, for example, researchers such as Bedoki and Goldthorpe, they argue that social mobility is not so much to do with someone's level of education and whether or not they have a degree and go to university. It's more to do, it's more influenced by people's parents, their family and their sort of social contacts than it is influenced by their level of qualifications. And then, as I referred to a few minutes ago, other researchers such as Patfield would say that um, higher education possibly influences social mobility, but in the longer term, because she talked about breaking that first in family cycle and therefore that in the longer term that um, participation in higher education could help lead to improved social mobility. So there is a variety of, of academics that would fit into sort of these three groups of school um, who may or may not believe that higher education helps lead towards social mobility. So I mentioned earlier that um, current policy unwinding participation is changing slightly as to what perhaps it was 20 years ago. Um, now, what do I mean by that? Well, there was some very recent research conducted in London by Rogers and Spores, um, and they commented on um, there is evidence that there is shifting focus now in government widening participation policy, and that um, they are narrowing the focus of widening participation policy so that now it's leaning more towards promoting um, the most talented pupils in low participation neighbourhoods like our own and um, pushing them towards the most elite universities. So by that, I mean the higher tariff universities, 
were the Russell Group universities or those known as the research universities. So the emphasis is changing from perhaps encouraging young people from um, lots of different qualifications and level three backgrounds into all kinds of university into this um, sort of top slice emphasis that uh, they're becoming the most interested in promoting access to the higher level research universities by um, the most talented, highest achieving academic pupils in low participation neighbourhoods. So that that change is beginning to happen and that was pointed out by Rogers and Spores. And they said that this, and I agree with them, um, that this is very concerning because um, whilst it's helping one group of young people in lower participation neighbourhoods, and that's obviously very good, but actually what it's doing is it, it potentially is leaving behind uh, a talented group of young people who are perhaps in the more middle band of level three qualifications and um, middle grades um, that are very talented young people, but are perhaps going forward not going to be getting similar levels of support in terms of accessing higher education through government policy than what they did in the past. Um, and uh, therefore, this may start to affect you slightly, but if it continues, it will certainly affect some of the young people in the year groups lower down schools um, compared to yourselves. And, and that is quite interesting and, and a little bit concerning. And certainly in their research, Rogers and Spores were kind of um, making reference to this and saying it's something that, that we should be very concerned about if we're thinking about um, equality of opportunity and allowing all young people to achieve their full potential. Um, so the emphasis, as I said, is on the top level of universities. So, so what tend to be called the research intensive universities. Um, and what it's doing is it's devaluing this, this new government policy emphasis is almost devaluing other university pathways. Um, so, so the universities which are referred to as the teaching universities or, or the post-1992 universities. So for example, universities like Nottingham Trent University or Sheffield Hallam University or uh, the University of Wolverhampton or Birmingham City University. Um, those are the teaching universities, the post-1992 universities. Um, and we seem to be having, um, you know, a, a bit of a, the government policy is uh, kind of splitting universities further into two groups, the ones which are preferred by government policy and others being sort of given a slightly uh, lesser ranking. Um, and that is something that seems to be emerging now in policy. Um, but I want to draw your attention to something because in the Midlands and in Nottinghamshire, um, we have graduate shortages in um, different professions and different job groups. And those graduate shortage areas are very well catered for by our Midlands universities, both of the teaching universities groups, the post 1992 universities and of our research and Russell Group universities. So a researcher called Sumner, um, she actually pointed out, you know, is it is it actually really useful for policy to be um, sort of putting a negative spin on universities that are teaching universities, should we actually be devaluing courses that are run and students that want to apply to these um, more modern teaching universities? You know, how useful is that? Um, and I want to look at some data with you produced by Dr. Charlie Ball. And I want to look at um, some of the graduate shortages that are in our local areas. So here's, um, now I'm working left to right across the screen. On the left hand side, we've got occupational shortages, of graduate jobs in um, Yorkshire. So areas like Sheffield, which if you're in Nottinghamshire, this is actually quite close to where we are. In the centre of the screen, I've got uh, graduate shortages uh, for occupations 
in the West Midlands. So uh, sort of Birmingham, Wolverhampton, Coventry, again, quite close to where we are. And on the right hand side of the screen, I'm showing you the occupational shortages of graduates in our East Midlands area. So in Nottingham, Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire, um, Leicestershire and so on. And we can see that we've got occupational shortages for graduates within professions such as nursing, um, drafts persons and designers, people who work in human resources, industrial relations. So in other words, business studies related uh, graduate jobs, uh, product design, um, finance and investment analysts and so on. Um, so what Charlie Ball is sort of pointing out to us here is that there are a lot of graduate skill shortages in our local area. And therefore, um, I would support, um, you know, people like researchers such as Sumner and her argument that actually our post-1992 and our teaching universities are actually doing a lot and running a lot of courses that are of interest to young people that can help address these skill shortages that we have in our local area. Um, and therefore, it, it is unhelpful to allow government policy to kind of devalue young people that make choices that are perhaps less traditional forms of higher education. Um, you know, students who say, well, I don't want to go away from home. Uh, I don't want to go to um, a, a Russell Group University. I don't want to leave home. I don't want to go and live in halls of residence and follow that very traditional route. Actually, what's going to work for me in higher education is that um, I live at home, I commute to university every day and study, um, and I'm actually going to do that with a post-1992 university because that works the best for me. I'm most interested in the course that they offer compared to a Russell Group University and that that's what I want to do. And that actually, if you're a student that feels that way, and you have looked at all your options and you have made an informed choice that that is what's going to work best for you, then actually it's really unhelpful um, that we are kind of making an emphasis of a two tier system and somehow devaluing um, teaching universities and their courses compared to research based universities and their courses. And furthermore, I've got some further information for you here in relation to Nottinghamshire. Our graduate retention rates in Nottingham and Nottinghamshire are very low. Um, that's because a lot of people that study in our universities come from areas further south. And a lot of people, when they've studied and graduated at our local universities, actually move back home. They move away from the area. So what that means is that if you're a graduate um, and a young person that wants to study at university in the Midlands or the East Midlands and you want to then stay in your home area and and have a graduate job in the Midlands or the East Midlands. There's actually, you know, a lot of graduate opportunities available for you and therefore there's going to be lots of opportunities. So you should not let some of the discussions and things that you hear put you off engaging in higher education, um, whether it's at a research based university or whether it's at a more modern teaching university. So just for a bit of fun here, um, I went away and although there's lots of people that went to post 1992 universities who've uh, actually gone on to very successful careers and earned you know, high salaries, um, I've actually found some sort of well known people who you may have heard of. Um, who actually went to post-1992 teaching universities. Um, so here I've got um, a very famous actress, comedy actress, Dame Julie Walters. Um, I've got the author and TV chef and presenter, um, Simon Rimmer. Um, Saira Khan, who she actually comes from Nottinghamshire in the Midlands, and she's an entrepreneur. She was a runner up on The Apprentice. She's a television presenter. Um, We've got BBC journalists such as Sean Williams. And if you're from Hucknall National School, um, then our head teacher, Mr Brailsford, uh, he also went to a post 1992 university. So here we have, you know, some evidence of very well known people who have achieved 
important, high status, influential and high earning jobs as a result of going to a post-1992 university. So therefore, if you are exploring universities, but you're a little bit worried that if you choose to uh, live at home, commute to a local university or or go a little bit further afield, but you're you're looking at a more modern teaching university compared to a research based university, um, you're a bit worried about that. Well, I would not allow um, anybody who's saying things that are negative or a negative discourse to put you off your choices if you feel that's what's going to work best for you. So I've covered an awful lot of material in a relatively short time. So what are the messages that I would like to take away from today's talk? Um, how would I summarise the key points that I would like you to take away from today's Hutnell Sixth Form Centre lecture? Well, first of all, I'd like you to remember that although the UK is the sixth biggest economy in the world, our social mobility record is one of the worst in developed nations. Um, this has re uh, resulted in many of our top institutions that have the sort of influence over society not representing our society and people like you and me particularly well. Um, an early 2000s uh, move towards widening participation actually resulted more in levels of increased participation in higher education and not necessarily levels of widening participation to the extent perhaps that policymakers hoped for. Um, and indeed, current policy um, seems to want a shift in emphasis at the moment, which certain researchers found very concerning. And current policy seems to want to shift the emphasis into a narrow interpretation of widening participation policy. And um, that policy also seems to want to further emphasise um, sort of some kind of stratification of higher education, um, you know, emphasising that it's a two tier system with research based universities and teaching universities. Um, students should not feel devalued by their choice of institution. Remember, researchers such as Sumner, um, and indeed I agree with this very fully, that um, students should not feel devalued by their choice of institution or indeed shy away from higher education simply because they feel the best option that works for them is to access locally based um, or sort of, you know, more, more teaching focused universities as opposed to more traditional pathways and more traditional universities. You should not feel put off by that. Um, and indeed, remember that in many geographic areas and in particular in the Midlands and in the East Midlands, the courses that our local universities offer are very much focused on answering local skills shortages and therefore they do open um, opportunities to better paid graduate jobs for young people and therefore offering you, um, you know, more opportunities in life and more opportunities for your children going forward. Um, so those are the, the most important summary points that I would like you to take away from today's Hucknall Sixth Form Centre lecture. Um, I do have references, um, so if you would like um, to know more um, or you would like to research more or read up on some of the references that I've talked about in today's lecture, then obviously they're written down for you here. I can also share those um, on an email around um, the Sixth Form Centre um, or indeed you're very welcome to email me if you'd like me to share an article or any piece of research that I've used um, with you and perhaps uh, if you wanted to find out more about that and you wanted to talk about it then obviously I'd be delighted to, uh, to talk about that with you and share that research with you and email you an article or something like that across. Um, so that brings us to the end of today's Hucknall Sixth Form Centre lecture. Um, I thank you very much for your attention.
Um, as I say, I am sorry that I'm not able to do this lecture with you in person like the ones in the past have, um, but hopefully it's still had an impact and it's still of use to you, um, even though we've had to do it on screen with Microsoft Teams. So thanks for listening, folks, and I'll see you when we're all allowed back to the Sixth Form Centre. I'll see you all um, very, very soon. Take care. Goodbye.